This is an A-level biology video, it's on the photosynthesis topic and I'm zooming in on the OCR exam board. We're going to be looking at firstly the structure of the chloroplast and how it's adapted to carry out photosynthesis and then we're going to be looking at the light dependent and light independent stages of photosynthesis. So we're looking at very complex biochemistry indeed because remember that includes the Calvin cycle. And then finally, I'm going to finish off by looking at some past exam questions. So this is going to be a very in-depth video indeed, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll feel a lot more comfortable with what is considered widely to be one of the most difficult A-level topics. The first step is obviously to think about what is the point of photosynthesis, and where is it carried out, and what carries it out. So photosynthesis is carried out by plants. Some photosynthetic bacteria also carry out photosynthesis, but we're going to be looking at photosynthesis in plants, so your bog standard photosynthesis. The whole point of it, remember, is to make organic compounds. And really, what we're talking about here is glucose. This is the method by which plants make their food. So remember, photo means relating to light, synthesis means making, so we're making food using light energy from the sun. Just to look at our summary equation, we're reacting water with carbon dioxide in the presence of light to produce glucose, and then oxygen is a byproduct of this reaction. Our balanced symbol equation is as follows glucose is a hexose sugar, it's made up of six carbons. Just balance it by using sixes. And now we're ready to really start looking in depth at photosynthesis and making this an A level video as opposed to a GCSE video. So here's a generic plant cell. Remember, it has a cell wall made of cellulose, plasma membrane, a permanent vacuole, and a nucleus. Crucially, it has green structures known as chloroplasts, and these are the site of photosynthesis. And if we take a closer look at those chloroplasts, we can see that they're quite complex organelles. I'm going to talk through their structure and explain how their structure is related to their function. So first of all, the chloroplast is green, and that's due to the presence of chlorophyll. Now, very importantly with photosynthesis, we need to zoom in on the thylakoid, which we can see is here. Now, thylakoids are small sacs which have a membrane surrounding a lumen, and we can see them here. And a stack of thylakoids is known as a granum. And you can think of the thylakoids as being individual coins, which a stack of coins would therefore be the granum. So we're going to start by making notes on thylakoids. So let's start by describing how the thylakoid membranes are adapted. So they provide a large surface area. And because the thylakoids are sac-like in shape, it means that they have an inside space. And that's needed for the accumulation of protons, and I promise I'll explain why that's important later. We'll just add a note here that's saying that granum is a stack of thylakoid membranes. Next up, we'll zoom in on the stroma. Now, the stroma is simply a space which contains the enzymes needed for the Calvin cycle, and one of those very important enzymes is Rubisco. Again, we'll talk about why that's important later. The starch grain is simply a carbohydrate store. The outer and inner membranes are important because they contain the all-important photosystems. Now we're ready to look at the biochemistry of photosynthesis. So the first thing you need to know is that photosynthesis is split into two stages. Now the first stage of photosynthesis is the light-dependent stage, and as the name suggests, it relies on light. So what happens here is that the water, which remember is a substrate of photosynthesis, absorbs light and is split into oxygen, hydrogen ions, and electrons. Now remember, hydrogen ions have another name, which is that they are also known as protons. The final product is electrons. And overall, this process is known as photolysis, which makes sense really, because photo means relating to light, and lysis means splitting apart. And so if you have a look again, water is being split using light and it is split into oxygen, hydrogen ions and electrons. Let's write a summary equation for that. And 
And we can see here that oxygen is a byproduct, and that explains why oxygen appears on the right hand side of the photosynthesis equation. Now we're going to get slightly more complex by looking at the products of photolysis and first of all we're going to look at these electrons over here. Now the electrons released by the photolysis of water enter photosystem 2 which is present in the thylakoid membrane and we're going to write that here. Electrons enter photosystem 2 which is in the thylakoid membrane. And now obviously we need to discuss what a photosystem is. The first thing to notice is that there are two types of photosystem, photosystem 1 and as I've already mentioned photosystem 2. Now it's slightly confusingly named that the first lot of electrons enter photosystem 2 first but unfortunately photosystem 1 was discovered first and that's what their name is based on. But don't worry, just know that electrons initially enter photosystem 2. But what is a photosystem? Well, they're structures in the thylakoid membrane that are made up of light harvesting systems that surround a reaction centre. So as an aside, we're just going to state what a photosystem is over here. Now the new phrase here is obviously the light harvesting system. Now these are made up of accessory pigments which include chlorophyll B, carotenoids and xanthophyll, which you do need to know the name of. So remember the main pigment is chlorophyll A, but there are several other accessory pigments which you need to know the name of. Now the role of these accessory pigments is to absorb light and use its energy to excite an electron. This electron is then passed to the reaction centre which contains that all-important chlorophyll A. And then chlorophyll A absorbs light, causing it to undergo photoionization, which effectively means that excited electron is released and is allowed to enter the electron transport chain. And so really photoionization is all about that excited electron being released and entering the electron transport chain. So I do just want to recap the most important stages of the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. Remember it's light dependent which means it relies on light. We know that water, which is a substrate of photosynthesis, absorbs light and is split into oxygen, hydrogen ions and electrons and that process is known as photolysis. Those all important electrons enter photosystem 2 which exists in the thylakoid membrane. Photosystem 2 contains the light harvesting systems which surround a reaction centre and those light harvesting systems really refer to accessory pigments which you need to know the name of chlorophyll B, carotenoids and xanthophyll which are important for absorbing light and exciting electrons. The electrons pass along to the reaction centre which contains the most important pigment chlorophyll A. That chlorophyll A undergoes photoionization which therefore allows the excited electrons to be released and enter the electron transport chain, which is going to become extremely important. Notice that sometimes the electron transport chain may be referred to as the electron transfer chain. It's the same thing. So the excited electrons are released into a series of proteins called the electron transfer chain. And as you'd expect, the electrons pass along the electron transfer chain, losing energy all the time, which is actually transferred to the proteins of the electron transfer chain. So if we have a look at what's taking place in this diagram, remember that we're still looking at the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. So here we can see that light has caused the photolysis of water, releasing oxygen and hydrogen ions, as well as electrons. As I've already discussed, that electrons enter photosystem 2, and then the absorption of light causes photoionization of the chlorophyll found at photosystem 2, meaning that those excited electrons get released into a series of proteins that we can see here in pink, and they release energy as they are passed along this electron transfer or electron transport chain. Now these proteins use that energy to pump hydrogen ions, protons, 
which remember were produced by the photolysis of water up here, and those proteins pump those protons from the stroma into the thylakoid space or thylakoid lumen. So let's make the next point. Proteins use this energy to pump the protons or the hydrogen ions produced by the photolysis of water from the stroma into the thylakoid lumen or space. And as you'd expect, this therefore leads to a buildup of protons inside the thylakoid space and effectively you've set up a concentration gradient. And just to reiterate, we can see those hydrogen ions being pumped from the stroma through those protein channels into the thylakoid space, the thylakoid lumen, so we're getting a large buildup of protons, hydrogen ions within the thylakoid space. And because we have that concentration gradient, naturally they'll want to move back into the stroma, and they're going to do that using an enzyme, which we can see over here, called ATP synthase. So hydrogen ions pass back across the membrane through an enzyme called ATP synthase. And as those hydrogen ions pass through the ATP synthase, they provide the energy required for the ATP synthase to produce ATP from ADP and an inorganic phosphate. And as you can see, the hydrogen ions are passing through here nice and passively because they're going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration and that enables that ATP synthase to combine the ADP plus that inorganic phosphate to produce ATP. And this flow of hydrogen ions through the ATP synthase is known as chemiosmosis. Why is it called chemiosmosis? Well, osmosis, because it's going from an area of high concentration here, lots of protons, to an area of low concentration here, few protons. And rather than it being related to water, it's related to protons, so that's why it's chemiosmosis. And finally, why is it chemiosmosis rather than chemidiffusion? Because it's a partially permeable membrane. Here's our double membrane made up of lots of phospholipids. It's partially permeable because it's only permeable at the ATP synthase. So the next stage of our story, of our photosynthesis journey, is to describe what's happening to that electron which got spat out by the first electron transfer chain. It now enters photosystem one. So electrons from the electron transfer chain now enter photosystem one. Again, light excites the electrons and in photosystem one causes the photoionization of the chlorophyll in there. The released electrons enter another electron transfer chain, which again use the energy to pump protons into the thylakoid space. So we're very repetitive. The major difference this time, however, is that once the electrons reach the end of the electron transfer chain, they are accepted by a coenzyme called NADP+. Now that NADP plus combines with those electrons that we've just mentioned, plus the protons that flowed through the ATP synthase to form reduced NADP, otherwise known as NADPH. And so to reiterate, we know that electrons pass through that second electron transfer chain. We know that hydrogen ions have been pumped by the ATP synthase. Both of these things now get accepted by NADP+. Because that NADP+, gains hydrogen ions, we can say that the NADP+, has been reduced. Because remember, reduction is a scientific word of which one of its meanings is the gain of hydrogen. And so as we look, we can see that that NADPH has definitely gained hydrogen and you can either write it with the H afterwards or just say that it's been reduced because we know it's been reduced because it's gained hydrogen. And this is the end of the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. We've used up water during photolysis, we've produced oxygen as a byproduct and most importantly we've produced ATP and NADPH which are vital for the light independent stage. 
Now the process I've just talked you through is known as non-cyclic photophosphorylation as the excited electron that enters at photosystem 2 is passed linearly along the electron transfer chain and photosystem 1 until it pops out at the other end and is accepted by NADP+. However, at times of stress or rapid growth, when the plant requires more AT than it can make from respiration, a process called cyclic photophosphorylation can occur instead. So let's make some notes on that. So above is an example of non-cyclic photophosphorylation, and that is because the excited electron that enters at photosystem 2 is passed linearly along the electron transfer chain and photosystem 1 until it is accepted by NADP+. However, under times of stress, i.e. when not enough ATP is made by respiration, cyclic photophosphorylation can be used to make extra ATP. And if you have a look at this diagram, all we're really saying here is that rather than our end result being NADPH, that electron keeps being recycled, it keeps passing through the electron transfer chain, pumping those hydrogen ions into that thylakoid lumen, creating that concentration gradient so that they can then passively pass back through the ATP synthase by chemiosmosis, making extra ATP from the ADP and inorganic phosphate. So in cyclic photophosphorylation, no acceptance of an electron by NADP+. Instead, the electron returns to photosystem 1. As that excited electron passes along the electron transfer chain, the energy is used to pump hydrogen ions into the thylakoid space. That's an and sign. So that electron passes along the electron transport chain. Energy is used to pump hydrogen ions into the thylakoid space. Hydrogen ions flow through the ATP synthase due to that concentration gradient. Remember, this is chemiosmosis. And in this way, ADP combines with that inorganic phosphate to produce ATP, which is what this cyclic photophosphorylation is all about. But because of this, cyclic photophosphorylation means that no reduced NADPH is made. So although it saves the plant in times of stress, meaning that more ATP can be made, it does mean that there's less NADPH to feed into the Calvin cycle, which we'll talk about shortly, and the whole point of the Calvin cycle is to produce glucose. So we're going to write here, less light independent stage of photosynthesis occurs. I promise this will become way clearer when we look at the second part of photosynthesis, and that stage is known as the Calvin cycle. We're now ready to turn our attention to the light independent stage of photosynthesis, which you probably called the Calvin cycle. Now, the light independent stage of photosynthesis relies upon the products of the light dependent stage, which remember were ATP and reduced NADP. And they were produced in the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. And so, what I'm really trying to point out here is that although light isn't directly involved in the light independent stage, without it, the necessary NADPH and ATP would not be available to the plant. Now, the light independent stage, the Calvin cycle, takes place in the stroma of the chloroplast. Whereas, remember before, we were constantly talking about the thylakoid membrane and the thylakoid space, we're now talking about the stroma. The overall purpose of this stage is to produce carbohydrates that can be incorporated into glucose or other organic molecules, and it does this through a series of biochemical steps. So our purpose of the light independent stage is to make glucose. So let's get into the nitty gritty of the Calvin cycle, the light independent stage of photosynthesis. Now the first step is the fixation of a molecule of carbon dioxide. And remember that carbon dioxide is one of the reactants on the left hand side of the photosynthesis equation. Carbon dioxide is fixed to ribulose bisphosphate, which you may have seen written as RUBP. Notice that this process may also be known as decarboxylation, it means the same thing as the carbon dioxide fixation. Crucially, this is carried out by an enzyme called Rubisco. Just notice for me that ribulose bisphosphate is a five carbon compound. It's so important that you know how many carbons are in all of these molecules. Now the fixation of carbon dioxide to ribulose bisphosphate forms an unstable six carbon compound. 
and because it's unstable it immediately splits into two three carbon molecules of glycerate three phosphate So two molecules of glycerate 3 phosphate are formed. It would make sense, therefore, that these molecules are made up of three carbon atoms because, after all, a single six carbon compound has split to produce two three carbon compounds. You can call glycerate 3 phosphate GP. Glycerate 3 phosphate is then reduced to triose phosphate, which is another three carbon compound. So GP, glycerate 3 phosphate, is reduced to triose phosphate. As the name suggests, triose it is a 3 carbon compound, and this process requires both ATP and reduced NADP. And remember that both of these substances were made in the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. Let's just reiterate again so we know carbon dioxide is fixed by the enzyme rubisco. An unstable six carbon compound is produced as a result, which immediately splits to form two molecules of glycerate three phosphate. And then due to the presence of ATP and reduced NADP, that GP is reduced to form triose phosphate, a three carbon compound. If we look at the role of ATP and that reduced NADP at this point, ATP provided the energy needed to convert GP to triose phosphate, whereas that reduced NADP provided the hydrogen needed to reduce the G3P into TP. We know that we've produced triose phosphate. What's going to happen now? Well, some of these triose phosphates are used to form hexo sugars, the most famous of which is glucose and other organic molecules. So this is actually the useful part of photosynthesis taking place finally. The rest are used to regenerate that initial ribulose bisphosphate ready for another turn of the Calvin cycle because after all it is a cycle, it just keeps going round and round. So the rest of the triose phosphate are used to regenerate RUBP. And so if you look at our overall equation for photosynthesis again, you can see that that water was broken down in the light dependent stage of photosynthesis by the process of photolysis. Um, I said that one of those byproducts was oxygen. The carbon dioxide was used in the light independent stage, the Calvin cycle, and the product at this point was glucose. So we've been through step by step the Calvin cycle, but now I want to show you a diagram which shows the Calvin cycle pictorially, and that should help you understand it just a little bit more. So remember, we're talking about the light independent stage of photosynthesis, and that takes place in the stroma of the chloroplast. To bear in mind, remember that we have that NADPH and the ATP, which was made in the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. So at some point they're going to be needed in the Calvin cycle. Because it's a cycle, you can start anywhere, but I'm choosing to start with ribulose bisphosphate, which is over here. Remember, it's a five carbon compound. And what happens is that the enzyme Rubisco fixes carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to the RUBP, forming a six carbon unstable intermediate, which you do not need to know the name of. That six carbon unstable intermediate immediately splits into the three carbon glycerate three phosphate, G3P, and then that G3P is reduced to triose phosphate, which is another three carbon compound, and that requires both ATP, you can see that going in here, and that NADPH, which came from the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. So, despite the fact that the Calvin cycle does not require light in order to take place, Remember, it does require these two substances and they could only be made in the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. The ATP has provided energy and the NADPH has provided the hydrogen required to reduce that G3P to triose phosphate. Now, some of that triose phosphate is used to make glucose primarily or lipids or amino acids. The rest of it is used to regenerate RUBP. And so we're ready for another turn of the Calvin cycle. Now I want to show you some past exam questions so you can have a real idea as to how you're going to be tested on this. 1a, figure 1.1 is a diagram representing a three-dimensional view of a chloroplast. Name parts A to C in figure 1.1. Remember that a chloroplast has a double membrane, so A is pointing at the inner membrane. B is a space, it lies between these stacks of thylakoids, and remember that space is known as the stroma. And then C, we can see a stack of thylakoid membranes. They want that collective noun, which remember is the granum. D 
describe two ways in which the structure of part C is adapted for its function. So here we're talking about the thylakoid membrane. Remember I said previously that it has a very large surface area and that enables it to absorb as much light as possible. It also contains that all-important pigment chlorophyll, chlorophyll A, as well as the electron transfer chain. The molecules listed below are all associated with photosynthesis. From these molecules, identify the enzyme. Well, this is interesting. This is really making sure that you know this in detail. That's Rubisco, which annoyingly, remember most enzymes have A's in their name. Rubisco is an exception to this. A product of the light-dependent reaction that is used in the light-independent reaction. I keep talking to you about this. It's ATP or reduced NADP. It's up to you which one you put. A three-carbon compound. Use the fact that there's a 3 in the name to help you here, so that's glycerate 3-phosphate. A compound that can be made from triose phosphate but is not part of the Calvin cycle. So remember that triose phosphate, most of it goes back to regenerate ribulose bisphosphate. The rest of it goes to make glucose or amino acids or lipids. So I'm going to pick out what I can see here, which is the amino acid. A 5-carbon compound. Very, very in-depth knowledge needed here. Remember that is RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate. A product of the light-dependent reaction that is not used in the light-independent reaction. Oxygen, for sure. Remember that's just a byproduct. I need to go check my list before I dive in. Yep, it's on there. Describe the effect of light energy in the light-dependent reaction of photosynthesis. So remember the effect of the light energy in the light-dependent stage of photosynthesis is remember to excite the electrons which, which were released by the photolysis of water and secondly causes photoionization of chlorophyll which remember releases electrons so that they can enter the electron transfer chain. If a plant is kept in the dark, it is still able to produce carbohydrates as long as it is provided with two products of the light-dependent reaction of photosynthesis. Give the name of these products and explain their function in the light-independent reaction of photosynthesis. So I keep talking about this, NADPH and ATP. So NADPH reduces glycerate 3-phosphate to triose phosphate and ATP provides the energy needed to reduce glycerate 3 phosphate to triose phosphate and the energy needed to produce ribulose bisphosphate from triose phosphate again and remember you can use those accepted letters right guys i hope you found this video super helpful i really busted a gut to get this out and make sure it was nice and detailed so do let me know in the comments below if you found it useful mm -hmm.